then we can do it. And I, be, I, I'm an, I have an enormous belief in the role of women. I mean, historically, they never yeah. had the chance. They were never, never empowered. Women were mm. never empowered. Maybe some societies, uh, clans or villages in Africa or Latin America, but now it's coming. And mm. I see that wave. When I was at the UN in the beginning, uh, 30 years ago or so, 10 or 12 women were heads of state and government. Now 35 or 40 or whatever. I met them all the time. It's only Sweden and the United States <laughs> where you don't have, to have a woman head of government in your history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so women, and then I, I, I believe very much in youth. You know, if we can really make, I think we should shift attitude to 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 working with youth, or rather, I would say we should not only work for youth, although we should do more. Welcome, I am Anders Bolling and this is Mind the Shift. International politics, security structures and diplomacy have changed dramatically since three, four decades back. Few have seen this happen more closely than my guest today, Jan Eliasson. Jan was born and raised in a working class home in Gothenburg, Sweden studied to become an economist and got his first employment at the Swedish Foreign Ministry at 25 years of age. He has served as a diplomat in France, West Germany, Zimbabwe, and the United States, in the latter place as an ambassador to Sweden, of Sweden. He's also been Sweden's ambassador to the United Nations. In the 1980s, John Eliasson was one of the UN's peace negotiators in the war between Iran and Iraq. In the 1990s, he served in the United Nations as head of the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and was a negotiator in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. He returned to Sweden, where he was a top diplomat at the Foreign Office and later also Sweden's Minister of Foreign Affairs. From 2008 to 2000, sorry, from 2006 to 2008, he was the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy to Darfur in Sudan. He's been an advisor to the International Red Cross and a chairman of WaterAid Sweden. In 2012, he was appointed Deputy UN Secretary General by the UN head Ban Ki-moon, a position he held until 2016. And th since 2017, he is the chairman of the internationally renowned Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Welcome to the show, Jan. Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, reminder of my age. <laughs> yeah, well, this was a very long and impressive biography, <laughs> but it still was only a brief summary. Is there anything you want to add to this? or? Maybe maybe take away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just happy with it. Thank you very much. I feel almost okay. tired, almost tired at listening. But it was uh, it was a, it was a concise and correct description. Yeah. Well, you have actually experienced all this. So these are strange times, as we all know. Have you did, have you had the opportunity of having a, a normal vacation t this year? Well, uh, since I came back from the UN, I, I have a completely different life. I worked yeah. uh, 12 to 14 hours a day in New York. And if I traveled, I traveled to Mali, Afghanistan, Somalia, and the neighborhood of Syria. Uh, and those were five years almost of uh, intense work with uh, very heavy responsibilities and some successes and some uh, failures and problems. And now I am a free man. I consider uh, CIPRI, the chairmanship of CIPRI takes up about 30, 40% of my time. So uh, I have time now finally to uh, meet with the family and, and walk my dog and, uh, you know, do things that uh, normally a, a retired person would do. Yeah. And Corona, of course, uh, has uh, changed the way of life so drastically. Uh, but I can't say that I've suffered from it. First of all, I, I'm hopefully safe from the pandemic, and my wife is also. But uh, I also live outside uh, the city, and uh, and I enjoy the tremendously beautiful Swedish nature. And uh, I 
walked in May and June and listened to birds that in New York I never heard. Yeah. So I'm rediscovering Sweden in a wonderful yeah. way. No, I'm very happy. Fantastic. Happy life. Sounds great. Have you had any op any opportunity of um, playing soccer maybe this summer? No, because I I my dog, my dear Leo, brought me down in a ditch, and oh. I had to I had to operate my knee one and a half years oh. ago. I and uh, that made soccer impossible, although it's my favorite sport. I know, and you actually did play soccer, not professionally perhaps, but you did play soccer on a pretty high level when you were younger. Well, no, the team was at that time a star team. We we won the Swedish uh, league, guys of Gothenburg. Yeah, yeah. But now they are fighting to struggle <laughs> to stay in the second division. I know. Uh, but uh, I was uh, I was playing in that uh, junior team, you know, young boys. But my father told me when I was about uh, 16, 17, that I should give priority to studies and not playing football. And I, Which you truly did. Yes, I did. As we know. Okay, so some years ago, I think it was maybe 10 years ago, I had the honor of sharing the same stage as you, actually. Uh, we were both invited by the, the Workers' Educational Association. Yeah. To talk about, the, you remember this, yeah? To talk about yeah. the state of the world. Uh, yeah. And I had written, at the time, I had written a book about the world saying that the world is better than we think. And as far as I remember, your worldview at the time was fairly optimistic. Mm. Is it still, would you say? No, I must admit that uh, my optimism has been reduced uh, somewhat in the last few years. Uh, if I call myself an optimist, uh, I would add that I'm a worried optimist. Okay. But in my dark moments, uh, when things are looking very dim and somber, uh, I almost land in the category of being a pessimist, but who has not given up. So uh, I circle between those two categories, worried optimist and pessimist who hasn't given up. I guess it depends on how you define optimist and pessimist. I sometimes think that you can, if you're pessimist, you're uh, irresponsible. But I mean, I, I know that you can define it in different ways. Because if you're a pessimist, you have given up because you don't think there's any point of doing anything. So you have to be, well, I don't know what your definition is, but. Still. No, I, I think uh, pessimism uh, is pretty good from one point of view because um, if you do worst case scenarios, which I tend to do, my wife has banned these scenarios at breakfast and dinner, but if I do it, <laughs> I do them, then I find that uh, I am better prepared when the crisis erupts because I've thought this through. And by the way, mostly the worst case scenarios do not occur. So you become a very positive person. It wasn't as bad as you thought. So uh, no. But for, I think, how, yeah. for, for how long do you stay positive when when the the, the, the disaster <laughs> hasn't hasn't happened? Well, that's where I come back to something which Alva Midol taught me: uh, never give up, even if mm -hmm. it's a very disastrous development. The future starts now, and uh, I think that I can recharge my batteries very soon, and accept as a fact the uh, negative developments also and take it from there um, and not give up. I think giving up is, uh, that's the worst part of pessimism. But I, I, I think I'm a pessimist who wants to see action after yeah. all. Hans Rosling, uh, who sadly passed away a few years ago, he, he called himself a possibilist, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was a term that he invented. What do you, what do you think about that term? Well, I think it's correct that you, you should, in every situation, look for what you can do and how you can repair and what, you, what direction you go from now on. And uh, then, of course, you have to identify both risks, which you have to do. That would be very unwise not to do. But also to, uh, to investigate uh, possibilities, potentials. So I think you need to have both sides in your future analysis. Yeah. Now you're a chairman of uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, and uh, you, of course, work uh, look into conflicts of the world uh, a lot these days, uh, as you have done before also, but now more, perhaps more focused. It seems obvious that the power dynamic between nations in the world is shifting. 
how in what way is it shifting would you say and how do you assess what is happening between world powers today well i think we have seen in the last uh, three four years at least uh, a, a rather drastic geopolitical shift uh, first of all the trust between uh, us uh, russia and china uh, has gone down to a uh, bottom line almost and the, and when you are in a state of mistrust uh, then dangers uh, grow and um, certainly there is this mistrust between these three major actors uh, and then you have uh, in my view a uh, decline in the standing of the united states as the leading democracy in the world uh, what they are going through now has uh, caused strains, in my view, on their own society, the uh, solidity of their democratic institutions, and also by that, the standing of the US in the world. So we have Europe remaining as the bastion, as it should be, or champion of democracy. And we are not in the best of shape either. We have uh, now gone through, or going through still the Brexit process very sadly we have failed to uh, unite around a common uh, migration uh, refugee policy and we have even uh, some deterioration in the health of our democracies uh, in poland and hungary in particular uh, so the situation is very much in flux and uh, there, to this comes, of course, dangers, uh, dangers from conflicts that uh, become more and more difficult to solve. And if there's mistrust with risks of misunderstandings and th risks of great uh, and quick uh, uh, escalation, uh, you have the uh, dangers in the South China Sea, you have the, the uh, now the Mediterranean, Turkey, Greece even. Uh, mm -hmm and around the uh, territorial uh, waters in, in the Mediterranean Sea. You have, of course, the wars in the Middle East. You have Syria still, you have Yemen. So there is an explosive character also under the surface, uh, which is very worrisome. Uh, and uh, to this should be finally added the uh, armaments aspects. Uh, from Cyprus perspective, of course, we are very concerned uh, after having studied this and made very objective research on the subject that the uh, expenditures on armaments is taking on uh, almost obscene proportions. Uh, 1,917 billion uh, dollars a year, almost two trillion dollars a year in armaments, 40 percent or so. The United is it States. increasing every year, or is it increasing in it, some, in some it countries? Has in it, it, well, it's uh, it's increasing uh, definitely among the three major actors: China, U, U.S., China, and Russia. Uh, and it's also some countries in the Middle East who uh, grow very almost exponentially: Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and so forth. So uh, when you tend to go in the direction of looking at security uh, purely in the direction of military security, then we are on the wrong path. Because I believe very much that security in today's world is more than military. It's also uh, climate change aspects, it's uh, pandemics, it's, uh, it's uh, deep poverty, it's uh, lack of human rights and so forth. We need to have a broader definition of security. I'm glad CIPRI is now doing research also on that, the broader mm. concept of security. But that's always been the case, uh, hasn't it? I mean, the things you mentioned now, they have always been there in the world. The risk of pandemics, the risk of, well, perhaps not climate change, but uh, the others, security risks and uh, poverty. Uh, all these things have, uh, in some in some respects, uh, become less worrisome, I think, but we still have our focus on them. And that might, might be a good thing, maybe, that we are focusing more on these problems than we did before. Well, I think uh, we had uh, a period after the end of the Cold War, we thought, 1989, a period of growing understanding between uh, the major powers. We had even Reagan Gorbachev, very important uh, meeting 1986 and onward. 
And uh, there was uh, a tendency of uh, more of cooperation, more of, uh, of uh, realizing mutual interests. But now we have a uh, deep mistrust among the major actors, those who have the armaments, those who have the, uh, the finger on the button, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, is, uh, that is the dangerous thing today. So you mean there was a, there was a larger trust between between the big superpowers, uh, say, in 1991, than there e is today. Even during the Cold War, there was an acceptance that international cooperation was a good thing, that multilateralism was the road to go. Mm. After the Second World War, we left behind the darkest period in human history, I believe, between 1930 and 1945, yeah. with the uh, Stalinist excesses, uh, with the gulags, with the... Uh, Nazism and fascism in uh, Japan and Germany and Italy, with the Holocaust, so with 50 million people dead in the Second World War. And then came the light, 1945, UN Charter, 48, mm -hmm. the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1951, Refugee Convention. And then uh, I myself was, as a young diplomat, part of negotiating, part of working out these international Uh, organizations. I worked with Ban Ki-moon recently to get the climate change agreement in Paris 2015. I negotiated the sustainable development goals. And all the time there was sort of no hesitation that international cooperation was the way to go. Now, particularly with the U.S. leaving uh, one agreement after the other in the Iran deal on nuclear energy and uh, the climate change, uh, Paris Agreement, the Human Rights Council, believe it or not, leaving what WHO, the World Health Organization, in the midst of a serious pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, by that, weakening the United Nations and mm -hmm. the international uh, structure of cooperation. That is new. I mean, so it's, it is a different situation right now. We have to take this seriously and turn mm -hmm. the tide. There is a lot of um, uh, focus on, on conflicts and many conflicts and many problems are highlighted, not, me, not least in the media, of course, but not so much uh, actually um, on, on the, I mean, many threats are highlighted, but not so much the threat from nuclear weapons. And I know that CIPRI is looking into this a lot. Why, why do you think this is? Because, I mean, the nuclear weapons are still there. No, there, there are some very dangerous trends which are not... Uh, enough uh, highlighted. The one is that you have a, uh, a, a, a sort of so-called modernization of nuclear weapons, which means that you develop, uh, quotation marks, smaller nuclear weapons, field nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons. And if you look at the effect of these weapons, they are probably four or five times at least, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you develop uh, something which uh, could, in the worst case, be taking away the uh, line, the sharp line between conventional warfare and nuclear warfare. Mm. Uh, that would be a huge disaster uh, if that were the case. And that in combination with the mistrust that I just mentioned and the risk for simple misunderstandings. You know, we have probably been close to nuclear war four or five times and about maybe only two or three of these occasions are known. Uh, that you were saved by the fact that a person realized that this was a mistake. You mm -hmm. had a Soviet officer, a colonel, who decided that uh, a very serious warning signal was uh, probably a technical mistake, and he did not push the Russian button. We also had uh, some wise uh, leaders, uh, military leaders in the United States, who took uh, the similar position on a what was they thought there was an intercontinental ballistic missile going past Hawaii. When was this? Well, three or four years ago at, at, uh, at the most. And they okay. thought was, this was in the midst of the North Korean crisis. Yeah. And the threats were pretty uh, evident from the North Korean side. And there was no contact between Kim Jong-un and, and, mm. uh, and the U.S. leadership. But uh, there were, th this was known. It's public. public. It, was, it, it could have easily led to that. So, you know, it's, it's a huge danger. We need really to to reduce those risks. And uh, now we have the almost, we are living without almost any agreement between US and Russia on nuclear weapons. INF treaty is gone, uh, abandoned by both, unfortunately. 
And now there's this new 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 start, uh, which expires on the 5th of February next year. And uh, it seems it doesn't look promising. If that is expiring, then there's a free-for-all on nuclear developments. Uh, the U.S. and Russia are the two major actors. So it's it's a serious situation on Cypriot. We do our best to prevent uh, present the facts and hope that the facts will kick. Mm. Well, this this sounds gloomy indeed. Uh, still, the world goes on. Uh, the world develops. Uh, the world evolves. The hu- humanity evolves. Things happen. People live their lives. They trade. They take their kids to school. They go to work. <laughs> you know, 7.8 billion people on this planet. Uh, so this is a question that is might be a bit odd to put to someone like you. <laughs> but when I listen to the, the media, I'm a journalist myself, so I, I know how the media works and uh, also listen to organizations and some politicians sometimes. Um, it sounds a little bit to me that the narrative is to, to be likened with um, uh, the strategy game risk, you know? Uh, so are we focusing maybe a little bit too much on the former leaderships of the world and Does that give us a false image of the actual development and evolution of the on the ground, so to speak, of all these billions of people who are doing so many things all the time and companies and entrepreneurs and inventors and, you know, all these things that are happening that are really important to people? Is there a risk that we kind of miss focus here? Uh, you have a point. Uh, you have a point. Uh, because uh, there are some very positive elements, uh, the growth of role of civil society, the uh, historic uh, shift uh, in favor of women's empowerment, which is coming and has to come, historic good news. Uh, the uh, youth, uh, even if they are struggling for jobs uh, in the pandemic age, <laughs> Uh, I spend some time with, you know, kids in school and universities, and I feel completely rejuvenated after having met them. You know, they are they are extremely good and have great instincts yeah. on peace and war and on environment and what is morally and ethically right and so forth. I also believe very much in uh, technology and science. My wife was uh, deputy minister of science and. She is telling me about all the progress that is possible uh, if we use it in the right way and give the resources uh, that are needed for for it. And then I believe, of course, international cooperation. But here is, I think, we need a mobilization, a, a rethink, a, a, a reaction to this uh, road to isolation, a road to identifying the outside world as problems. If we go in the direction to consider the outside world as a problem, uh, whether it is merchandise, uh, trade, or uh, ideas, democracy, human rights, or human beings, refugees, migrants, uh, then we have uh, we are on the wrong course. And uh, if that is then used to polarize countries and, uh, and uh, make sure that you identify the outside world as enemies, mm. uh, then you we create a very dangerous world. But I say, you're right. I think we should not look only at organizations and uh, even governments. Uh, I usually say that I have the UN Charter here, by the way. <laughs> It was just oh, really? <laughs> That's the, great. The first three words of that charter, it's we the peoples. Yeah. It's not we the governments. Exactly. It's we the peoples. And and this means that in order to get things done in today's world, we have to adopt an, what I would call an horizontal approach. Mm-hmm. We have to get away from the silo approach. The, ver- down. the yeah, vertical approach. Uh, and the vertical approach. Yeah. You need to I'd put the problem in the center. Water, let's say, water or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you gather the, around the table those who can do something about this problem. Yeah. And then you decide upon informally or formally about some type of division of labor. And this means that, as you said, you have to turn to the private sector. Uh, they are, for, for instance, very much aware of the sustainability demands now, uh, mm. the SDGs. And you have to turn to the academic world. They are There's so much potential there to pick up for uh, reaching sustainability and fighting climate change. Uh, you have to reach out to civil society with all the aspirations and dreams of regular people. 
Uh, and we need also to, in my view, to work harder with parliaments, the elected representative democracies. They should be part of this process also. And the more you mobilize broadly, the better the multilaterals will work. And I think we, we, we really should t- take a bit of blame on ourselves also in the way w- the market economy and democracies have acted. The pandemic, uh, the corona crisis has shown the enormous uh, inequalities, not only between nations, but also inside nations. And, mm. uh, and uh, that people have been, regular people have been left behind and mm. feel betrayed and deserted. And of course, this is the climate in which uh, Donald Trump is uh, gaining uh, votes and yeah. sympathy. And it's also the climate in which Brexit happened in the UK. And it's also the climate in which uh, extremist movements, uh, extremist parties are gaining ground. So therefore, yeah. I think we need to go back to the root causes and start to think about what the world should be like post-corona. I think that's where our intellectual energy should go. What kind of world do we want to see in Sweden and in the world, Europe and the world, after corona? This is a good yeah. chance to see, to ask ourselves, do we want to go alone or go together? Do we want to, to accept pluralism and so forth? And uh, do we want to see a step taken from the fight against pandemics to the fight against climate change, which to me is a logical step yeah. or will we do it the other way around consider the outside world as a continued threat and demonize the outside world well what you put set your mind put your mind on what you focus on is what's going to happen i believe in some in some way it's a philosophical way of looking at it but but i mean if you're focusing on solving things you're probably more likely to solve them uh, to extrapolate from the question i was asking before maybe this is the time this is the best time in history for that kind of cooperation that we are talking about now you are talking about now uh, private sector parliaments uh, civil societies um, coming together to solving problems because it's it has never been as easy as it is today to get together and meet as we are doing now over over thanks to tech, to, to technology and this is happening all over the world. I mean, people in Europe are connecting with people in Africa and people in South America and people in Australia, wherever, to solve problems. So I think that is something that is, has actually never really happened before. So in that respect, we might you might say that we are living in, and at the same time, as you are saying also, we have this mistrust on the top level, the top layer, so to speak, between governments. But underneath, there are so many other things happening, and we are seeing that people are protesting in the streets against an array of, of problems, be it the climate change, be it uh, women's rights, be it uh, the COVID-19 measures. So things are happening on different level, levels here. And uh, are, are we maybe living in crucial times, do you think? Indeed, is- indeed. No, no, you're right. And I mean, this is a revolution. Uh, the uh, communications are digital revolution is incredibly important and is a factor that we should take into account not only as a channel of of information and knowledge but also as an instrument of change and it is important that that potential is uh, used positively because it can also be used negatively Uh, the communication revolution on on social media has led to a uh, uh, increased polarization also and the language and the uh, the, uh, the differences between groups and people have gone deeper. But I believe that if it's uh, channeled the right way, it's a tremendous force for change. I can give you an example. As chair of CIPRI, uh, we were faced with the decision whether to uh, cancel a big conference that we have had for six years uh, in the spring. And the uh, sort of gut reaction from people was, well, we have to cancel because of corona. But then we identified a group of whiz kids uh, young men and women who were expert on this fantastic uh, new technology. And uh, we asked them, could we organize a conference uh, of that kind? We had normally 900 people coming into Stockholm from all over the world, 30 countries. And we organized it. And we had in the end a studio outside Stockholm uh, where we had our panel discussions. And then on the screen were all the stars in the different subjects. And we had for one, we had to extend the conference from three days to, to 10 days because oh, the really? demand was so enormous. We had in the end 
42 different sessions on peace and development, different wow. aspects, with, uh, with 3,800 active participants in the discussions, and we reached out to 163 countries. In other words, uh, you, you, we had a much bigger success digitally than we had in the conference in Stockholm, to which people had to pay airfare, <laughs> hotels to get there. <laughs> and now we had gra yeah. graduate students who, for free, could connect with us from Nairobi, Bangkok, Buenos Aires, and so forth. Fascinating. So, uh, no, no, you're right. I mean, they, they, we should really see the potential and the new possibilities, as we talked about earlier. Yeah. And you were touching upon the issue of democracy and, and what people vote for. And we have, I take it your word, uh, by the uh, the rise of the so-called right-wing populism and xenophobic parties and all that. But but still, these are, they have risen because people have voted for them, obviously. In most, I mean, there are, of course, other countries where elections are rigged. But in most countries today, elections are fairly fair. <laughs> Uh, so people actually vote for these leaders from the Philippines to the United States to Turkey to Hungary and Poland and even Sweden, France and, and other countries, uh, still not in government power, but, but, but large parties. Have maybe Western leaders been a little bit uh, naive about the effects of a widening and which something that you could call a widening and deepening of democracy? since these parties have actually been voted for by people who have had these uh, opinions, obviously. No. I'm, the, I'm the first one to agree that we have to go to the reasons why people vote for these movements, for these uh, polarizing forces. Uh, there is a uh, well of, of frustration and disappointment of being left, uh, left outside. You know, the, you look at the income, middle class, and even and the working class, in most of the democratic countries, it's, been, it's a very sad, uh, sad conclusion you draw. They have not improved their conditions. Why people who live on capital have gained almost uh, astronomically in some cases. Uh, those inequalities, of course, hurt. And then if you combine that with a tendency which has been rather dangerous in many countries, including our own country, namely the differences between city and, la and, and, uh, and countryside, uh, the, the smaller communities and their struggles to keep services and so forth and keep young people to stay. And that is uh, the, the, uh, the ground or the, the, the uh, fertile soil for these movements. And when they push the button of identifying elites represented by the uh, people in power who have lived comfortable lives, high income and part of the culture and the capital and so forth, then mm. they push a button which uh, uh, creates uh, strong emotions. So you have an emotional quality which you have to understand or respect. So that's why I think we should be self-critical. Uh, when we look particularly now at the post-corona world and that we want to create, that we try to right these wrongs and to make sure that we have more of justice and more of uh, equality and uh, understand that this <laughs> UN Charter's first words are we the peoples. Yeah, whether, it, yeah. whether it is their longing to live in peace or longing to live in decent working conditions for their families and... and uh, living conditions, sorry, for their families, or whether it's human rights. Mm -hmm. We have to put the human being in the center. It sounds like a banality, but the more I work in international politics, having worked a lot with uh, hard security and geopolitics and... Uh, oh, so uh, yeah, And you were very engaged in this water issue. Yeah, yeah, right. But, yes, I did. But the, the, yeah. I, the, more I, the more I look back, the more I realize that uh, what really counts is what you, when you make a difference for people's lives, whether it is peace, development, or human rights. Have you felt that you have had an influence, that you have been able to make a difference, as you say, during those, this well, long career? It's, for, it's not for me to say. To say, but uh, what's your uh, feeling? What's your what's no, your I'm proud uh, on, the on the diplomatic field, if I may say so. I'm pretty proud of having negotiated the Human Rights Council 2006 at the UN. I'm pretty proud to have uh, 
created the, uh, uh, as president of the assembly, uh, the peace building commission that broadens the peace efforts from hard security to broader security. Uh, I'm pretty proud to have established the first uh, well-functioning humanitarian corridor in Sudan, 1993, where we were fighting to, uh, struggling diplomatically to get a ceasefire, and it didn't work because the governments didn't accept the rebels uh, diplomatically or politically. So instead we suggested a humanitarian corridor, which saved maybe 50, 60,000 lives at that situation. So things like that, that are a result of negotiation and using the diplomatic machinery. I've been part of that very much in my six mediations. Mm. Maybe we couldn't get lasting peace, but we got ceasefires, like in Nagorno-Karabakh, and in the end, the Iran-Iraq war. So um, in that case, in that situation, yes, a bit of difference, hopefully. Uh, and hopefully sending the message to the next generation uh, diplomats to put the human being in the center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm constantly out sending that message now and, and trying to share my experiences with the young generation and hope that they will do the work uh, even better, much better than we did in our generation. Yeah. Beautiful. And you have a working class background, uh, of course, uh, and most of the diplomats that you have been interacting with over the years have not, uh, pretty obviously. Um, do you think that your background has affected the way you have dealt with international crises and and uh, and other diplomatic issues? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. No, no. I I am extremely grateful for what uh, what my parents made made possible for me and my brother. We were the first one to get uh, more than seven years of school. And oh. uh, there were hundreds of years of dreams and aspirations that were channeled from my parents to to the two of us. And uh, uh, that uh, gave me an enormous energy. Uh, I was under expectations, but uh, unspoken mm. expectations. My parents were extremely proud, but never demanding. No, they didn't have the pressure on you? So no, you no, no. They just, oh, they just expected us to be the best. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that went for sports as well as for for uh, for uh, studies and then uh, the work. My father was extremely proud as a social democrat to see me be uh, engaged by Olof Palme, the prime minister. Oh yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Be, that. Uh, joining him in the mediation Iran Iraq. He, I'm glad mm -hmm. he he lived as long to see that happen. No, it, 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 it's it's been with me all my life and and uh, it has made me also comfortable in most environments. I, I feel very close to the working people, those who do the work that we don't see, who are not paid enough, and who are exhausted after life and work. And, but I also feel absolutely relaxed in, uh, among presidents and kings and uh, prime ministers. I'm not too easily impressed. <laughs> Because I, I had a great education. Uh, I got the best of education. I became mm. a Navy officer, by the way, so I learned the manners. Oh, should have put that in the bio as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was a Navy officer for three years. So, uh, no, no, I have just uh, enormously grateful for my life. And, uh, I just hope to um, hope that, uh, that we don't see the shift of... Uh, of trends because uh, I live my whole life personally and professionally to see improvement all yeah. the time, all the time. And you're living proof. Your yourself is a living proof that things have improved. I think you have. Yeah, all right, say, right. But uh, as you said, I don't know where we're going. <laughs> so well, we you never know. Everything is always changing. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. only constant is that that is change. That's, that's right. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And if you if you if you if if you accept that, then but it, it doesn't come automatically. Doesn't come automatically. No, no. But yeah. I mean, change can be it can be two steps forward and one step back, or two steps back. But it's yeah. still constant change. So oh, anyway, yeah. that's yeah. my yeah. philosophy that you have to accept that everything is changing. And when once you accept that, it makes you feel a bit calmer because yeah. then you're not as you don't get as stressed by things changing all the time. No, that. You should also adopt my worst case uh, scenario. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, Maybe. <laughs> you're constantly in a good mood because it wasn't as bad as you feared. That's true. That's true. Uh, well, you you are the th I think you are the Swedish person who has um, 
held the second highest uh, position in the United Nations. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't missed anyone, no. And no. the very widely acclaimed Swedish Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, was the, the top man in the United Nations. He was, he had which wasn't as known when he was um, in office, but afterwards, when he, after his death, it was more widely known that he has a spiritual side. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you th do you sometimes think that there is a higher purpose to, to what is happening? I mean, you've seen so much and been around so much and met so yeah. many people. Yeah, well, no, I, 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 I have adopted more of that approach over the years, I must say. I read uh, the way Marx. Uh, the yeah, American, that's the book. His book, yeah, Hammer at Shell's the book. age of twenty-six or so, I think. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I recall I was a bit mystified. Uh, I was much, very much action-oriented, now mm -hmm. and here, and all that. And then, uh, the more I lived and saw the world, and uh, maybe the worst parts of the world, disasters and death and everything. Uh, the more I came back, came to appreciate uh, what he uh, wrote. So I think I read Waymarks ten times or so. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay, has it made more, back, more and more I, sense every time? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I gave I gave I gave lectures in the United States about how Marcel Swagmark and Waymarks uh, markings wrong translation. Um, okay, uh, and. Um, I did it together with music. I had a pianist, Per Tengström, play Mozart, Beethoven, wow. Bach. That sounds really be beautiful. Between the waymarks. And then I read uh, I read my waymark and explained why it was important for me. And then Per played a piece. And uh, I never had such a rapt and, uh, audience. It was just you could hear a nail fall in the pause between the... the uh, Readings, anyway. No, he's a. I, I, I think you, you have to have a, an element of spirituality uh, in you. Uh, you have to so look for a higher purpose and uh, see that uh, you were given the uh, the gift of a life, and that you have to take care of that life and do the mm. best out of it, not only for yourself but for others. And actually, the best thing you can do for yourself is to be helping others. That's yeah. as easy as that. Beautiful. Wow. What are your hopes? This is a big question, but to, to, to end with, uh, maybe it's a, it's a pertinent question anyway. What are your hopes for the world now in the near future? Well, uh, it's not a forecast. <laughs> it's a wish list. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I hope why not? That, well, I hope we, we come back to uh, humanism, to uh, respecting each other, to going for the root causes of the problems, and uh, that we work, understand that the most important word in the world today is the word together. Practically nothing can be uh, achieved uh, on our own. In any area, you, you need to see that you are part of something bigger. And that means, in concrete terms, as we talked about earlier, that you have to bring in elements of society that normally you don't work with to get solutions. Because the problems are so complex, so you have to bring in the different actors, parliament, business, private sector, academia, and so forth that we talked about earlier. Uh, and then, of course, uh, I hope that we start to be reasonable about uh, how we deal with security. It's, it's unacceptable for us to spend these enormous amounts on armaments in a world where we are struggling for to achieve climate change and uh, affect conditions so that people now will not migrate because of climate change. In the Sahel, you already have movements because of three or four years of draft of hundreds of thousands of people up to Libya. And we need to go to the root causes of, of dealing with those problems. Still, I, I am optimistic from the point of view that if we, if we really mobilize the resources that we have, 
then we can do it. And I, be, I, I'm an, I have an enormous belief in the role of women. I mean, historically, they never yeah. had the chance. They were never, never empowered. Women were mm. never empowered. Maybe some societies, uh, clans or villages in Africa mm. or Latin America, but now it's coming. And mm. I see that wave. When I was in the UN in the beginning, uh, 30 years ago or so, 10 or 12 women were heads of state and government. Now 35 or 40 or whatever. I met them all the time. It's only Sweden and the United States <laughs> where you don't have, have a woman head of government in your history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so women, and then I, I, I believe very much in youth. You know, if we can really make... I think we should shift attitude to, to, to working with youth or rather, I would say we should not only work for youth, although we should do more. People, young people are faring very badly, also in Sweden. The potential is lost to us for so many people, even in our rich country. Uh, abuse among parents and, uh, and uh, no encouragement and schools that are not uh, evenly uh, favored, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but also the uh, enormous potential to work with young people. We should have a much more of a consultation with young people. We should make them feel that they are running with the baton, the next relay, and that we should work with them, discuss with them the environment, peace and war and everything. I, mean, I, I, I went to school with 11-year-old kids. I mean, they, they had the right instincts. I went to another school with 15-year-olds, and I was... <laughs> encouraged they had a solution for syria <laughs> even in the end oh really <laughs> yeah and then the universities of course so no no and then uh, knowledge uh, you and i would talk about that if we use technology right not this this information technology and do that right uh, and then we need leadership we need political mm -hmm. leadership people who stand mm -hmm. up and really stand up for values and not uh, put the finger in the air and feel where we winds are going and, Coming. Maybe not leaders, leaders, but more inspirer leaders. Yeah, yeah, inspiration, yeah. inspirational yeah. leaders more than the, yeah. top down leaders. But inspiration uh, combined with practical action, you know, realizing that you have to be down to earth and get things done on the ground in the end. Because, you know, to just come with sermons doesn't help. You need to, mm. you need to be uh, credible, credible mm. on the ground, get dirt out of the nails. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I really love this preamble in the, the UN Charter that you had there. We, the peoples, not mm -hmm. we, the governments. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sir. yeah. Fine um, concluding words, maybe. John Eliasson, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Thank you very much.